Philip was born in February 1977 in Hanover, Germany. He moved to London at the young age of 19 and has uh, lived there since. Philip works as an independent photographer pursuing commercial and personal work and is also a publisher of photography and a curator. Along with his wife, Olivia Arthur, he is co-founder of uh, Fish Bar Gallery and Publishing House, which is in Dalston, East London. So if you're passing through East London, please do drop in. A quick selected biography for Philip would be, in 2008, he was a participant of the Jupe Swart Masterclass. In 2009, he was a finalist at the Center Photography Awards in Santa Fe, America. In 2010, he was uh, nominated to the Prix Pictet. In 2010, along with Olivia Arthur, he opened Fish Bar, which was a space to show, talk about, and also publish photography in East London. Uh, in 2011, Philip published and edited Jeddah Diary by Olivia Arthur. Uh, also in 2011, he was the curator and the publisher of Father and Son, Pablo and Richard Bartholomew at Fishba. Uh, in 2012, he uh, was the curator of Unknown Quantities, uh, the work of four young Magnum photographers, which was shown at Fishbar and also published by Fishbar. And in 2014, he, he uh, published his book, which was called Land Without Past, which, we, which he'd been working on for a, for a long time. And it was a book about the village where he grew up in Germany and also uh, the kind of relationship to the past that Germany has. And uh, this book has been uh, very, uh, it's won a lot of great critical acclaim. And it was even pronounced as the, the best photo book of 2014 by uh, Jörg Kohlberg. Uh, one off, he says. He's very modest. Uh, uh, by Jörg Kohlberg of Consentious Photo. And on that note, let me hand it off to uh, Philip whenever he gets his um, laptop sorted. Drew, thanks for the introduction. Um, I thought I, I would give a little overview uh, over how I got into photography and um, how I ended up doing this book uh, about 10 years later. Sometimes it takes a while. Um, so I, um, I don't do a lot of public speaking, so I had to do, I wrote quite a lot of stuff down. I hope you don't mind if I, if I read stuff. Um, I had finished uh, school in Germany and the sort of state service that everyone had to do then, sort of like going to the army, but I didn't go to the army. And um, uh, th this was in all in a little village in North Germany, which became the subject of my first book, but this is uh, many years earlier. Uh, and I kind of couldn't wait to get out of there for many, many reasons, like you do when, y when you're done with school. And I traveled quite a lot and um, never really had a name. I never really knew uh, where there was no there was no particular destination. It was just about travel, really. And um, uh, one trip, I I kind of got stopped over in London, and <laughs> all of a sudden I'd found a destination. Um, I had just turned twenty, actually, not nineteen, <laughs> and um, I didn't speak English very well, and I didn't have a lot of money, uh, but I wanted to stay there, so that I did. I applied to art school, um, uh, even though I'd never really done any art. Um, I just thought it was a really nice place to go. Um, I stuck a lot of pictures I had taken on my travel on a large piece of A4 and sort of made it look arty, and I did some pencil drawings. And um, I didn't think they would take me, but they did. So that is how it started for me, really. And, uh, and I remember being drawn to, to photographs because of their, their stillness, really, and their suggestiveness. And um, I was captivated by the sort of strong power that good photographs have and 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 I was not initially very interested in what lay behind pictures I was more you know the issues and narratives and individual story of the subjects and that that didn't really interest me that much I was so sort of captivated by just the strength of good pictures and um, I believed and I think I still do that good strong photos transcend the subject matter anyway and they talk about something else that maybe the photographer hadn't intended to put in the pictures um, and, and that has always fascinated me more than any particular subject or story to this day, actually. Um, I'm put, I'm sh the reason I'm showing these photographs is because they were um, taken outside my house where I lived for a long time in Whitechapel in East London, Bangla town, they call it. Um, and they're not really 
I mean, they're just a market that I pass every day, three, four times. And um, this particular afternoon, I came home and then there was just a freak snowstorm that lasted for 10 minutes and then all the snow was gone. And I just had my pic camera on me and I took these photographs. And in a way, that um, that is what I love most about photography, that moments that you haven't planned for and that maybe not don't seem all that special can become really special. Um, um, after I left photo school, I decided I, sh I should try and make it in London because if I could make it in London, I could do, you know, I could do anything. I could, I could be anywhere, I thought. Um, I hadn't really an idea, though, what that meant and how I would go about it, but... But everybody um, uh, that I was hanging out with at the time were sort of aspiring to be in magazines like ID or The Face or Days and Confused, also The Sunday Times or The Guardian. And, and so, you know, I was no exception to that. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be published in these cool magazines. Um, and um, I had always enjoyed doing portraits uh, because of the, the sort of intense short moment you have with a portrait subject. and. Um, you try to understand something about them or learn something about them and try and put it in the picture and and it's kind of over quite quickly as well um, as a as an encounter and I've always I've always enjoyed that so um, I, when I put together a portfolio that has little landscapes in it and portraits and stuff and what you do when art school and I went to see picture editors I started getting portrait jobs and I thought I'd show you some of the things I did and I still do for a living because um, had I not been able to make money as a photographer, I think I would have not continued being a photographer. Um, I was kind of brought up in a practical way that I needed a job. And if it wouldn't turn into a job, I don't think I would have continued doing it. So I thought I'd um, I show you some pictures. So this is all, this is all work, but I still like it. Um, there's a band called Block Party, a band called Coldplay, Jack White, and again, uh, he's a film director called Dino Risi, Nick Cave, singer. He's a journalist uh, called John Simpson and his son. He's a, an artist called Paul Fryer in his bathtub. Uh, Jarvis Cocker. He's uh, an Italian philosopher, Gino Spinulo. Brian Ferry from Roxy Music. Uh, Damien Hurst. Somebody whose name I've forgotten. Uh, she's an, an Italian singer, quite a diva, and I've forgotten her name too. Um, Ettore Sozza, she's an Italian designer. Um, well, and this was a picture I took for Days and Confused. Um, I managed to work for these cool magazines. And, and she, she'd won an award for her illustrations. And I was sent to do pictures of anyone who won the awards for these, um, for this magazine. and. Uh, um, I thought she was she was really cool. She was kind of funny looking. She bought a new dress extra for the picture, and um, we got on, and we're still in touch actually over ten years later. But it's funny because this picture ended up in the National Portrait Gallery, and it's funny how it happens. I mean, it wasn't planned or um, somehow organized. So I'm still I'm still drawn to portraits, and I still do portraits less than I used to, but. Um, I, I kind of like that you can reduce things down to um, you know, simple things. You el maybe eliminate the background or um, you, know, try tr you, you try and zo zoom in on, on, on just one thing that's really important. And, and I really like that. I, I did this for a bit and, and I, I, I got sort of a little bit well known for, for portraiture. And um, I started missing something and I started missing a sense of continuity in what I was doing because every, these, these are all single images and I wanted to expand what I'm talking about from outside a single frame and um, um, so I found myself more drawn to issues as well so I started doing documentary projects that really used largely portraits sort of environmental portraits and I didn't bring any example of that because it's not stuff that led anywhere but I started doing more classic documentary stories using portraits. And um, um, what I did bring is, is this, and I wanted to talk about that. That's my first book, which is here. Um, the copy's in the bookshop. <laughs> if 
there. And I really, I mean, this, this, has, been, um, this has been complicated for many, many reasons. One reason uh, was that I, I, I wanted to somehow talk about Germans pa Germany's past, which is not only a subject that gets talked about a lot, but also one that most Germans kind of had enough of hearing about. Um, but I started doing this work initially when I went to the Jobsbart masterclass. And, and I kind of thought that that would be it. I would not continue doing it because it's kind of personal. I started photographing at home. In fact, Pablo Bartholomew, who was talking yesterday, came with me um, many years ago. We were going to the Castle documenter and we stopped at my parents' place and he went, man, this is amazing. You've got a photograph here. And I was like, what are you talking about? This place is boring. I left here. So anyway, um, I did then photograph there and I, I spent many years talking about it in many different ways, never being quite able to nail it down, what it was that I really wanted to say. And um, when I finally published the book, I s well, before I published the book, I sat down and, and wrote it out. And I managed to put it in one page and I thought I can't say it any better, so I'm going to read it. I have a hand-me-down memory of my grandmothers from just after the end of the Second World War. I'm going to flip to the first picture here. She's standing next to her bicycle looking over a field of rubble where her old neighborhood used to be. She had grown up and lived here in Hanover for more than 30 years, but now she cannot find her house, nor can she find her way around. There are no streets left to guide her, just piles of rubble as far as the eye can see. She returned to her husband's bakery in the countryside and vowed never to go back. I grew up in a village very close to hers, a place where many of the old families are related to mine and where people in the street know me by face. It was my entire world and the only place I knew until at the age of 19 I packed a bag and left. I ended up in London and decided to start a new life. 18 years later I'm married and still here. Desti despite my long absence from the village, it still occupies a central part of my identity. It has indelibly shaped my sense of the world, who I am and how I function. Even now that I have lived here, um, that I have lived nearly as long abroad as I have lived in Germany, I still call this patch of earth home and I doubt that it will ever change. In the spring of 2008, I returned home for the first extended period in over a decade to try and put my feelings about the place into photographs. I stayed for two and a half months, reconnecting with old friends, revisiting my old schools and spending time with family. My parents were in the process of retiring and their very routine lives were in the in an unusual state of transition. Spending time with them and people I had not seen in many years was both wonderful and exasperating. People started asking if I had given up on living in London. I started wondering myself. I had always been slightly uneasy about going back home, as if the mere journey home had the potential to undo my hard-won new life in London, as if being home would question the logic of my leaving, and I wouldn't have any answers with which to defend it. But one thing I did know was that returning and photographing what was once a familiar felt like a form of catharsis. The Germany I grew up in didn't feel like an old country. It was a place obsessed with making new. New roads, new houses, new cars. As if by making new, we could somehow undo the past. When I was a schoolboy, the years, the Nazi years, were so dominant that they overshadowed everything else. They were like a black hole sucking up all other history that came before. We were left only with perpetual renewal, heaping layer upon layer of present in order to one day get away from that history. <laughs> the German poet and critic Hans Mag Magnus Enzenberger commented on his country that the Federal Republic, this is Germany, is blessed with a unique deficit. The Germans have single-handedly blown up their history, a brutal demolishing business that has rendered the country into a spawn of the new. Returning to my village, I, kn I knew the past needed to become part of the work. So I went over my family's photo albums. Luckily, my mother had kept her mother's albums from the 20s and 30s. In them, I discovered the colorful life my grandmother had lived in the years of the Weimar Republic. The images were beautiful and carefree, a remarkable window to a time to which I had no access. The trail of pictures uh, that Thea, my grandmother, left behind ends with a wedding, not hers, a few years later to my grandfather, to which strangely there exists no pictures at all, but of her best friend Lizzie's to a man in SS uniform. The remaining pages of the album are empty. I now appreciate that the history of my country is in constant flux. Still today, 
It is barely 25 years since the communist part of the country joined the rest, and I believe it's not an exaggeration to say that no two generations in the last 100 years have grown up in the same country. I have now become an observer from afar, but what I see is a country that is changing yet again. A country that is slowly and carefully taking on the responsibilities that befits its economic size, and one that is doing so with humility and hindsight. Today my country is not a young country anymore, and I accept that the title of the book, Land Without Past, may strike people, some people, younger Gen Germans maybe, as nonsensical. That's fair enough. Each will have to grapple with their own ghosts, or maybe the ghosts of the past have been laid to rest for good. Either way, I'm glad I've managed to make peace with mine. Okay, I'm going to show some pictures. Um, this is a bit of Playmobil I discovered in my parents' attic that I hadn't touched, and nobody had touched since I left. It's my uncle. my mother sitting in front of a picture of Hindenburg. Um, it was quite difficult to find photographs that were sort of showing everyday life, um, if you can call it that, um, during the Nazi period from my village. But um, mm -hmm. So the I said that in the text, the photo albums were mostly empty because there were lots of photo. Everyone has a photo album. It's not like people were ha didn't have cameras, but um, the pictures all disappeared. And this is what uh, uh, inspired the design for the cover, empty photo corners. But I did manage to find some. This is my grandmother, and Thea, the namesake too, the other Thea that's in the room. I kind of like this picture because of, well, many reasons. I like I like how they the two boys are getting t told off, but I also like the rail on the bus shelter and other people standing around. Just going for a walk with my grandmom again. I like the, the three generations going on here, and it's a, it's a birthday party. Um, this is dance, dance school. I went to dance school in, in this place. So. This is um, somebody being given an award for being a good bricklayer. This is my dad. He doesn't like that picture. <laughs> um, lunch. This is something uh, interesting. So the German flag was never, you could never see a German flag in Germany anywhere when I grew up. I mean, this, this type, the harmless one. Um, <laughs> uh, just because um, well, I don't know why exactly. I mean, they were government buildings, and and you know, if there is a the football World Cup, you see the flag. The flag is on the T-shirt of the players, maybe or something. But um, the flag was not really present anywhere. I didn't know anyone who had a flag in in the house or anything like that. And you know, the army jackets that were quite cool that everyone wears that used to rip off the arm um, the flag because you didn't like the flag, and now it's kind of cool to have the flag on the jacket. I see people in London or the US have a German flag on their shoulder. Which always struck me as, as odd, but there's nothing wrong with it, I suppose. Um, but then this one actually, so the Football World Cup, uh, when it came to Germany, it changed things. Suddenly the flags were everywhere, and it was a massive deal for me, and for lots of people. Suddenly were people were putting colored paintings in their faces, and they're wearing the Germany flag and the T-shirts, and that was completely new. That, was, that never happened before. So that's why I took that picture. These are my nephews. As my dad, when he retired, he had a bit of a heart scare, but he's okay. Uh, is that my old school? 
so it's really all about this place I grew up in. I mean, it's kind of, it doesn't, it's a place in the countryside and, and you know, it's a bit awkward sometimes, but it's actually quite nice. We have these um, vans by the motorway exit where um, prostitutes work, which <laughs> always fascinated me as a child. Why is there a van there? Oh, it's broken down. Oh, it's broken down again. <laughs> yeah, it's always, a <laughs> it's a every day it's broken down. <laughs> Um, it's a piece of moor that my, well everyone, all, all the families have a bit of moorland where you used to cut the peat for the, you know, my dad still has a peat. There's my grandmother and her friend Lizzie. Um, there's my mom. See now this was crazy because um, I'd never seen a picture of any Nazis in my village. So this is the, the barn in the background there. It's where my parents got married. I've got a wedding, a wedding picture in front of that door. And um, like I said, nobody kept any pictures. So I'd never actually, I mean, I grew up seeing Nazi pictures uh, every year in school. And it was not like we'd not, I've not seen pictures like these before. But um, when you find it so near to home, that's almost like, I mean, that, that was quite something. I, I was a bit, I, was, I think I was, I was really nervous when I opened the album and I found this picture. So I, I took it. My, some grand aunt of mine I hadn't seen in 15 years, she had, she had an album where I found quite a lot of these. Um, and I recognized instantly where it is and, you know, I know the place. And, and so that was quite something. Ooh, and that too. So I know some of the kids here who were, well, passed away now, but I knew them when I was younger, when they were older. And this is my neighbor, this is the same lady. She also gave me some pictures. Oh, and the pictures of the woods, that's all about. So I have these different levels, right? I have documentary pictures, and I have the historic photographs, and I have uh, five, four landscapes that do something else. They're meant to represent a sort of romantic idea of Germany. And to Germans, the forests are very important. I like the cobwebs they put on the, this is in an album, and they, they sort of, pr to protect the photographs, you have these intermediary pages, and this one had uh, spider webs, and there's even a spider there. It's funny. And this is my dad cleaning an impossibly clean terrace. So there you go. That was the end. Um, that's the book. It's at the bookshop. So, I mean, that body of work was with me for a long time, and I um, almost nev didn't turn it into a book because I thought, you know, it'd be somehow pers too personal. And, and anyway, who wants to know about Little Village in Germany? But I did in the end, and I'm very happy that I did. It kind of took some weight off my shoulders. And um, this is this work I wanted to show briefly, um, which probably will be my next book. And I suppose it continues my own journey in the sense that it's about London. Um, but it's not that personal. So um, there's no Nazis, and there's no my family's not in it either. But um, it, it's about um, these parts of London that I and everyone I know have always lived in because they're cheaper and, and they're more interesting and they are kind of also a little bit forgotten and unknown and there's a lot of it all around the center, uh, the center of London and then all around like a donut around London are these places with funny names like Freezy Water or Ponder's End or Catfoot. Um, and I've always been fascinated by the, the sort of texture of London um, because it's so unplanned and so haphazard. I mean, if you live in India, maybe that's not so surprising, but if you come from a ver very organized German village, it's very um, adventurous. So there you go. I'm going to run through these quickly, um, and they're going to be hopefully out as a book next year at some point.
In fact, I should, uh, Olivia and I did a walk around London where we, where we sort of traced this entire belt that is around the center of London. And it took us 10 days of walking full long days every day, nonstop, and taking some pictures along the way to come back home. So we left, we left the house, turned right, walked out to sort of three o'clock on the clock, and then kept walking around and around and around and around, and we came back from the other side to the house. And it took us 10 full days, it's a bloody long way. And it's, yeah, these are some of the pictures, and then some other pictures mixed in with it. Have any of you ever lived in London? Does anyone, anything look familiar? This is holy that should be familiar. This is a cool place. This is right by the... Um, by Terminal 4, uh, uh, the airstrip, what's it called, landing field. And people use it as a little green space, not even a park, it's just like a sort of next to a car park. And people use it as a destination to have picnics and watch the planes land. Secret Muslim drink is exposed. <laughs> that was in Whitechapel. Like that. And this is this is the last picture in this series. This is up in the in the north of the city. There's a park that's called Gunpowder Park where the army used to test ammunition for the Second World War before they dumped them on my hometown. And um, you you can now go there and uh, there is fences around all the holes that the ex test explosion left behind. Okay. Should I show this? See, see something completely different? Okay. Um, this is uh, <laughs> okay. This is up in, in the British Council on the wall, and I've not mentioned it at all so far, and nobody's um, talked to me about it either, so I don't know if it's gotten noticed or not. But um, if a few years ago, I, I kind of got really frustrated with photography, and I wanted to do something completely different because um, I was frustrated with photography. And, um, but, I, but I wanted to do portraits. Um, because I like the way you can organize them and my mind needs to organize things. And um, I didn't want to do them like I had always been doing them, which is you go to someone's place or you meet someone and then you kind of try and set them up, light it or not, or put them in the scene or something. I wanted to, I wanted to um, remove all the unknowns and bring everything with me sort of thing. So basically like portraits used to be made back in the days when photography started out. And I had all these backdrops made, I like painted, I hand painted, and and then I started traveling around with it and started doing these set up studio portraits. And it was really liberating in a way because um, when normally when you do documentary work, you're never off. You're always on. You're always there might always be a picture you can take. And and so the people you meet, your subjects, can never really relax because you might take a picture of them. Um, and this was different because it was like, okay, I'm, I'm setting up the stage and it takes me a long time. I'm using a slow camera. It's a 5.4 plate camera and there's a light and there's the backdrop and it's, it's like a circus. And, and people know when, when their turn is to be photographed. And I liked that. I really enjoyed that. And it was sort of, it's called the Sunday Best because I wanted people, I didn't want to be, it's like a reaction on to, to, to um, you know, what's it called? where people put pictures all the time, um, Instagram. Um, I, I, there's a reaction to that sort of stuff where we constantly eat selfies and do pictures ourselves and, and it's all very unformal and I wanted something very formal. So there you go, um, that's what this is. And, and I've been doing it for a while and I've only managed to, I had them hand painted in fact as well. I tried to do it myself and I, just, I couldn't do it, it's so difficult. So in the end I went to somebody who was he was very good at it, um, here in Delhi, in fact. 
And um, I've got only 11 pictures here, so I'll just show these quickly. This is in Delhi, old Delhi. This is in uh, in Haryana. Mm. This is in Buenos Aires. As is this. Uh, this is in Germany. He's the world championship, world champion in driving donuts with his car. <laughs> This is also in Germany, somebody's grandmother. This is a German hippie with his chicken. And this is back in India, in Haryana as well, I think, yes. And this is back in Buenos Aires. He's a fo <coughs> football fan. So I've asked everyone, you know, basically put on your best clothes or do, do the thing you're proudest of for the picture. I don't want to do a candid picture. I want you to really, like, represent yourself. And this guy said to me, I watch football, so <laughs> we did a, we did that. But I still put my backdrop in the background. Right. Okay. That's it. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. So raise your hand if you have a question, please. Oh, hello. Hi, Philip. Hello. Uh, great talk. Uh, my yes. question is actually regarding this work. This work. Yeah. So uh, the question is that why didn't you? Uh, shoot them in color, or why did you just not leave them as black and white? Why was the decision of getting them hand painted taken? Oh, because I liked it. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> Looks really nice, no? Uh, going back to your uh, project back in your village, uh, you know, obviously uh, the D German uh, history and you know, generation after generation, still, it's like such a huge mountain uh, mm. people still carry. Yeah. Uh, for you going away, uh, did you manage to kind of blank it out in certain sense? Mm. Uh, or did it uh, keep coming back to you? You know, I, I did what all Germans do when they go abroad. They pretend not to be German <laughs> for a long time. And then I th at some point, it, it was just stupid. So I'm, um, I suppose the more I became English, the more I started telling people I was German in a way, so it, it was, I mean, Germany changes, you know, and, and I mean, the narrative has moved on as well. I mean, it's, I wonder whether my brother's children who are sort of 21 and 19, um, whether they feel the same way that I do, because it's very far, even, even the reunification of Germany for them is ancient history. And for me, that is just the other day, even though I was only 12 when it happened. But still, it feels very, very, I watched it on telly and I remember, and, and it feels very, but the first time I went to Berlin felt that all that is very present. So to me, that's now, and, and that was, so the war is not that far away. Um, uh, so for a long time, I kind of didn't want to be reminded. And that's, I think, the reason I left. Um, and now I'm very happy to talk about it and be reminded or um, tackle it head on, sort of thing. The first image that you had while you were reading the young boy, Yeah, yeah. Uh, who is that? Because it looks so much like uh, the character from the tin drum in the movie. Um, should I try and find a picture? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, is so the boy seated? Yeah, the shorts, boy seated. I know. black and white. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, let's see, it is a neighbor. Um, but is it from an album or is this yeah, a portrait you shot? No, no, this is an old picture. Um, no, it's um, he's he's related to me and he's a neighbor essentially, but I, um, you know, I. He he's sort of me in a way, I guess. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, this is in 1932. Um, kind of just about tell the haircut there. Um, it was a big picture when I found it. I thought it was amazing because it's so... It's like the, uh, the sort of picture I would have taken had I been there as a photographer. So it was, uh, it was very lucky. I mean, I also I hadn't mentioned this stylistically. I cut all the pictures to be exactly the same frame as my own photographs, um, as in square. But they weren't square when, when they started out, they were whatever format they were. 
but I wanted them formally to sit right next to each other. I wanted it all to be quite strict. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs>